Kitco News special coverage of the Future Blockchain Summit is brought to you by Cook Finance, a revolution in DeFi asset management. Gareth, you've just met Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist of InTheMoneyStocks.com. Florian Grumes is the Managing Director of Midas Touch Consulting, and I am David Lynn, anchor for Kitco News. I've had the pleasure of working with both of these gentlemen on my show for at least a year now. Um, this is the first time I've had you both That's on right. the same panel together. That's Welcome. right. Welcome. Welcome both. Amazing. And I like both of them, not because they're just nice guys, but because they're good analysts. They're accurate in their calls. Florian, and this is all you can go on Kitco.com and on Kitco's channel on YouTube, and you can verify this yourself. Last year, Florian in the summer has said that Bitcoin will be the best performing asset of 2020, beating gold, precious metals, stocks, bonds, he was correct. He said the same thing earlier this year. So far, he is still correct. You've got two more months to be wrong. We'll see. <laughs> Gareth Soloway has made a number of correct calls this year. In May, I'm breaking them down because they're hard to keep track. There's so many. In May, when Bitcoin was still at around $56,000, he said it would go down to $30,000, retraced to $30,000. In two months, it hit 31. At that point, he said it would go back up to 52 before retracing. And in exactly three months, in September, it hit 52 before retracing. And now he's calling for potentially $20,000. So, the first questions I have for both of you, where is Bitcoin heading next? Let's start with you, Gareth. Okay, so being a chart guy, and I'm short term, so my long term views, you know, David, I've said long term, I do believe it's going to 500,000. Um, question is how long is that gonna take? Short term, being a chart guy, I have to focus on that $65,000 high that we recently hit in, I think it was in April. And as long as we stay below that, then technically this is a lower technical high. So again, one of the things I do is I, I take the emotion out of it. There's so much hype in Bitcoin, but you have to let the chart dictate your move. So as long as we stay below Bitcoin, I'm in the bearish camp in the near term, even though I'm bullish long term. Uh, before we get to Florian, I want to understand your methodology first. So how do you read charts? How did you come up with that conclusion? And of course, well, I'll let you answer that first. All right. So, so a couple things. Number one, Bitcoin began in 2009. 2013, we made a high of 1250. That was the first cycle high. 2017, the second cycle high of around 20,000. And here we are four years later. So remember, each one is four years. So what I'm saying is that as of now, four years later, we've hit 65,000. That stands out to me as the cycle high for this cycle, unless proven otherwise. Meaning that if we take out 65, then that wasn't the cycle high and we could still go higher. But again, the chart has to tell me that before I jump to that conclusion. As much as my gut or my emotion wants to say, yeah, let's do it, you know, let's rah, 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 charts are the king for me. Florian, I know you also agree that charts, markets, you, you told me offline earlier, you have to listen to the markets, right? That's what you said. But I think you have a slightly different take in the short term. Tell us your view. Right, right. I mean, until I would say three weeks ago, I would be probably more agreeing with your point of view. But listening to the market, Bitcoin is just so strong over the last three weeks and it went too far. You cannot really make the bear case anymore. I think it just takes a few more thousand dollars, four thousand yeah. dollars from here. We take out the high from April and then we're off to 100K. So what I see is there is this final parabola kind of brewing. Mm -hmm. So I think it looks like we're going to run there. And I think until the end of the year, we're going to see even more crazy crypto party. So that's actually my take now. And just a few weeks ago in your show, I said I, I was also more like putting my short term bear head on. But listening to the market, I have to say this is so strong. I cannot be a bear anymore. So I believe we're going to see a crazy run really until the end of the year now. So would you, so my, my only concern, so we have this ETF on the futures that debuts next week. So right. you've seen this massive hype going into that. And if you look at when the, the Bitcoin uh, futures debuted, I think it was in 2017, that actually was the top. And we actually saw, so here you have the Bitcoin ETF on based on futures debuting. Do you, do you see any sort of replication of that event? I mean, is, is that totally, I mean, do you see that coordinated kind of event or not really? No, I agree that this kind of like sell the news event right. happened in 2017. It was the top for Bitcoin, not for Ethereum and the altcoins, so really another few more weeks. 
We recently had a sell the news event with the Salvador adoption. Right. Um, I don't think this ETF topic is so huge right now that it would justify a final top. And going into such a top, I don't see any new highs. So I, I don't think uh, the argumenting on, on, on based on that news coming up, maybe in the next week we're going to see an important new high at the top. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I think. Um, it's too strong. This rally was too crazy. I mean, I was with you in the same camp until 52. Yes, retracement 61.8%. Okay, now another wave down. It only went down to 40K and it came all the way back, roaring back $20,000 within less than three weeks. Here we are. Okay, there is something other, another thing going on. So I'm, I, I'm back in the bull camp. I think. It's going to be a crazy run until the end of the year. Nice. Okay, but let's just back up and talk more fundamentally about this ETF. So just for background information, the U.S. is set to release its first ever Bitcoin ETF very soon. And so uh, Gareth is arguing that it's overhyped. Let's talk about why we're even talking about this. Would any of you, would either of you buy a Bitcoin ETF? Let's start with Florian first. No, I'm definitely not of ETFs at all. I mean, we have this discussion from the precious metals for many, many years. I understand that for institutional investors, it's a totally different thing. The retail guys, the small guys, they don't need to buy an ETF. They should buy Bitcoin, put it in their own ledger, cold wallet. That's the way to do it. And the same is true with gold physically in your own hands. Yeah. But for the institutional money that need a regulative background, Yes, they need an ETF. So that's why the whole scene is so euphoric about, about, about an ETF approval. Gareth? Yeah, so I, I definitely wouldn't touch the ETF. Um, at a certain price point, I would look for an ETF that's based on Bitcoin itself. I would caution investors that understand what a futures-backed ETF is. It's going to go to zero always, all right? And this is scary, I know. But when you base an ETF on futures, there's a contract rollover. And let's say the current month is $10 and the next month is $11. So they have to sell the, the current month at $10 and buy the 11, which means you're, they're going to buy less each time, which means the value of that ETF is going to decline. So it's not going to happen overnight, but over the course of months and years, that ETF will always lose value, uh, which is why, honestly, I'm shocked that the SEC uh, approved this one of all of them. Um, personally, I think I that's ridiculous. Because the average investor doesn't know that. They don't know that. Well, I mean, the, I think it signals institutional confidence yeah. in the asset class, which is probably what drove it up. Um, okay, Florian, you also told me offline about what you believe is, um, you, you've discussed this with me before, the concept of a crypto winter. Mm. If you look at past cycles, especially after 2017, what happened after 2017? Bitcoin crashed and it stayed low for three years. Okay, can it happen again this time? Definitely it can. Uh, I actually would expect it if we get this parabolic spike over the next few months. I would expect a crypto winter next year. Yeah, for sure. Gareth, of course, you've looked at the, uh, the, the, the double top that yep. Bitcoin has formed in both 2013 and 2017. Yep. We're looking awfully similar to the same pattern, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's what we're going to find out here. And what's interesting is that we'll know probably in the next two weeks, right? You're either going to bust through 65 and continue up, or it's going to stall out and then continue its way down and recorrect. So, so I, I, it, can, it will definitely have another winter. It's just a matter of is it now or, or like you're thinking in a six months. I don't know what when yeah, you think that's going to have next I year. Mean, Probably January, March, somewhere could be the top. Well, let's move on to uh, the more fundamental aspects of Bitcoin. But before we do, let's just poll the audience. Who here thinks Bitcoin is headed to $100,000 before the end of the year? Raise your hand. So basically up. Okay. So half. Good. Down to 20000 before the end of the year. Raise your hand. Okay, so a minority. All right, you got, you got for, it. For the record, I don't think it's getting to twenty by the end of the year. If it does, then there's bigger problems out there. Bigger problem. You'd be buying with hands and feet. You told me. Right? Absolutely, <laughs> I would buy it with hands and feet. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, the fundamental aspects of owning Bitcoin. Considering that Bitcoin is evolving into an asset class, while well, cryptocurrencies are evolving into an asset class of their own. We have to talk about investing in the asset class and diversifying our portfolio to include that asset class, which leads me to my next question of asset allocation. So let's, let's start with you, Gareth. So, so for the average investor, um, 
I think 10% is the right allocation. That might seem small uh, to a lot of people out there at this conference, but you have to remember, you know, you have people with millions and millions of dollars that are diversified. There's a lot of elderly, middle-aged people who are not going to feel comfortable investing with the swings that Bitcoin does. I mean, even the one that dropped, you know, 60 to 30 is a 50% drawdown. You can't have a huge amount of your portfolio. Now, if you're young, all right, you got 40 years till retirement. I think that's different. But again, anyone at my age, 40 years or above, probably 10% allocation right now is correct. Okay, before we move on to Florian, I got to ask them, what's the other 90%? Right now? You know I'm bearish on stocks. I do know so that, I, but, but they don't know that. Tell me. Tell me. All right. So, so there are certain areas like I like China stocks right now because they're, they're very, they've been beaten down like crazy under these regulatory issues. But I think gold is a place you want to be. Even though Bitcoin always seems to be like anti-gold, I think there's a spot for both I'm, of I'm those. I'm just going to pause right there. Don't okay. you think Bitcoin replaces gold? I know that's a leading question. You're welcome to say no. I think it a, a huge chunk replaces gold, yes. But... But there, there absolutely is a place for the, in the next 20 years or so for gold to still go up a hundreds of percentage points, which for me as an allocating investor, I do want to have exposure in gold and metals. Well, if gold goes up hundreds of percentage points, how much does Bitcoin go up? Once it gets down to 20, it's going to 500, so that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Florian, let's talk about your asset allocation. How much would you hold in Bitcoin? Whoa, I mean, it's a, it's a personal question, right? Uh, yeah, I'm asking you, you personally. Personally, well, it's way above 50%. So, um, okay. but, but I'm into the space for many years. I know what I do, at least, I mean, about where I invest. Obviously, I have no, no clue about the future neither. But so, so let me ask you this. Who, what kind of investor would fit your profile? If I had to ask you, gee, you know, what kind of person would also buy 50%? It would be an original hodler. So, I mean, that, okay. that, that's the, the kind of type, you know. But, kind of but Because you don't sell your Bitcoins. I mean, at least not the large part of it. But um, I think the most important thing for those people who are not invested at all, please take $50 and buy Bitcoin. Just get your hands on it. Don't make it too complicated. Don't question, like, how much should I put everything in it or not? Should I buy now or tomorrow? Just do it. Put $50 into it to get your hands on it. If you have an allocation between 1 and 10%, I think you're doing fine because this is your hedge against inflation. Right. This is your wealth preservation kind of way forward. Together with gold, I'm a big fan of gold, but right now I would under allocate gold and definitely overweight uh, Bitcoin. This will change next year, I guess, but right now I'm all in crypto actually. If I may jump in, just one of the reasons why I'm also a little concerned about over overdoing it in, in Bitcoin itself is that we aren't necessarily 100% sure yet which cryptocurrency is ultimately going to be the, the ones that end up being that those top cryptocurrencies 10 years from now. So while Bitcoin looks like the dominant force, does Ether overtake it? Does Solana? I mean, there's so many and it's always rotating because it's such a new asset class that, again, if you're going to do it, maybe even diversify within cryptocurrency a little bit. Well, let's talk about that. That's an excellent point. Can Bitcoin be dethroned? I mean, I've heard both sides of the argument from Bitcoin maximalists. They have said, well, look, there's been tens of thousands of coins that have been launched since the inception of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is still the dominant coin in terms of market cap. Yeah. So that obviously hasn't done anything to dethrone Bitcoin as the largest coin. Then there's the other group who says that, well, yes, Bitcoin is already lagging in terms of its technological efficiency. There are many coins that can supplant Bitcoin in terms of its um, tr transaction speed, transaction costs, its peer-to-peer -peer system. It, Bitcoin just doesn't really do anything when you compare it to other utility coins. So it will be replaced. In fact, I've heard the argument that Ethereum will become the next Bitcoin. In fact, the Ethereum flipping is already happening. So let's talk about it. What, which camp are you in? I'm in the camp that most likely Bitcoin is the dominant force, but there's still that 25% chance that it isn't. And I think you have to as an investor, I mean, if you're someone who's going to allocate, you know, someone, let's say, 20 million portfolio with a 10%, you need to be aware of that. So I'm in the camp that there's always a chance. I, and, I, and I'll just say this, folks, is since I've invested since the late 90s, I have had plenty of stocks, and they were stocks back then, go bust or have massive down moves. And I've learned that nothing is infallible. Nothing is, is invincible. So I have to, from now on, I'm always that conservative trader that's thinking about the negative possibility to protect me. Okay. Florian, what do you think? Yeah, for me, Bitcoin is the base layer, the trust layer. And I don't see any... A big, big change in within the dominance. 
But what I love about the space, and that is thanks to Bitcoin, the free competition. I mean, that's what we all need and what we all want, a free market, free competition, lots of good ideas, lots of projects, 1,000 coins. I agree with you, most of them will at some point go to zero or diminish. But um, who am I to know which one will be yeah. the, the big coin in 10 yeah. years? Yeah. Right now, it's Bitcoin. I think over the next few years, it will remain like this. It is the most decentralized coin, which is the most important thing about it all, decentralization. So um, I'm very optimistic, and Bitcoin definitely will survive the next crypto winter, while yeah, most of sure. those other coins, who knows? Well, that leads to the uh, ultimate philosophical question is why buy Bitcoin in the first place? What's the point of buying Bitcoin? Because if you're buying Bitcoin as a form of a stable coin, well, why not just buy a stable coin? Why not just buy USDC? If you're buying Bitcoin as a base layer for a DeFi protocol, why not buy Ethereum or Solana? I mean, if you're buying Bitcoin as a store of value, why not buy gold? So what is the point of buying Bitcoin? The purpose. I mean, for me, it's, it's the same reason I want to buy gold, is I don't have very much trust in the Federal Reserve and our government in terms of the debt. Um, the future looks bleak in terms of the dollar, and I want to be hedged against that. You know, I want to go to sleep at night knowing that if I wake up the next morning and there's been a dollar collapse, that I'm okay. Florian? Yeah, it's decentralized freedom. I mean, yeah. nobody can stop Bitcoin. Uh, it's been the best performing asset over the last 10 years. Still, the vast majority of people is not involved and not invested. Uh, digital scarcity is a concept that more and more people will understand in the future. It is the base layer. Um, I think you don't want to miss out on that. You, you need to have it. And it's, it's a form of gold, although I don't really like the comparison. I think it's two different things. Um, but, but I've definitely, I mean, I love Bitcoin. I'm very grateful that it exists. And I think it's actually the only way for us, mankind, to, to, into a better future. Because we see it everywhere, like governments controlling us, totalitarian everywhere. Um, Bitcoin is freedom. That's the answer. If you consider Bitcoin as the ultimate store of value, like some proponents would consider, Michael Saylor, for example, CEO of Michael Strategy, has been a proponent of the notion that Bitcoin is a store of value. Here's a proposition. Why don't I just put all my savings in Bitcoin, sleep on it, literally don't even look at it for 20 years, and just make that my savings account? I'll let you start with that one, buddy. <laughs> you can do it if you know how to weather the volatility. If you only use the money that you can actually lose and don't need it tomorrow, why not? I mean, this is a personal decision. I said it before. It really, I mean, trading and investing is counterintuitive. It's about psychology. It's about yourself. You need to know yourself. If you can weather that kind of volatility, do it. Let, let me ask you a different way, Florian. Would you trust Bitcoin enough to not touch it for 20 years? You close your eyes for 20 years, leave it alone, your savings account, it's going to go up. Would you, would you put all your savings in that idea? If I had to make the decision right now, yeah, or, yeah I would do it. You? Uh, no. <laughs> no, but again, if there's one thing I know, it's that I know nothing, right? I mean, that's the bottom line is that... I do not know what the future holds. I don't know what the government's going to do. I don't know. So, so when you say putting all your assets into Bitcoin, I mean, yeah, if I don't want to sleep for the next 20, 30 years, sure. You know, but aside from that, but, but I think can't about do it. it. Everybody, everybody here puts their savings in cash. Everybody here has a bank account, I presume. Yeah. And that cash, this leads to our next topic of conversation. That cash is going to, there's a 100% chance that if you hold a US dollars in cash, you will lose value in the next year. There's a 100% chance you will. But there is not a 100% chance you will lose value in Bitcoin. Think about it. But so, so this is, right. So yes, 8% inflation next year. That's what they're projecting. So you're going to lose 8%. But... What if Bitcoin falls to 20,000? How much did you lose there? So what about, like again, going back to diversification, I don't mean to be a broken record, but a little bit in gold, a little bit in crypto, a little bit in stocks, a little bit here and there, and hopefully you can at least come out break even. And I think that's the goal. So that leads me to my next topic of conversation is macro and inflation. Inflation is quoted by most economists is the number one fear right now, uh, at least in the United States. Florian, I'm going to start with you because I know you're a proponent of the idea of the crack-up boom of the right. Austrian School of Economics. Yep. So, um, all right, let's, let's talk about that. What is that? Well, it is, first of all, a continual expansion of the balance sheets by all central banks on this planet. It doesn't matter if you take the Americans, the Europeans, the Chinese, the Britons, the Australians, they all devaluate uh, your currency by expanding it constantly. Madame Lagarde in Europe just recently, last week, pr printed 25 billion euros 
out of thin air. So this is the one thing that happens. Now you see prices exploding. Of course, it's direct, directly correlated to this balance sheet expansion. And on the other hand, people slowly but surely becoming aware something's wrong here. My salary is not keeping up with it, but grocery is getting more expensive. Energy prices, gas prices, everything goes up. So people step by step losing the confidence in the system, losing confidence into the currencies. And they all start to look around, where can I put my money? And you realize that the, the currency itself loses value by the day. And then you get this parabolic, at the end, hyperinflationary wave. And the only protection against this has been precious metals for the last 5,000 years. And now, since 10 years, we have Bitcoin. Uh, just to follow up, Florian, we've seen hyperinflation in previous examples of the crack up boom. Weimar Republic, for example. For example. Their Reichsmark after the First World War depreciated to basically nothing very quickly overnight. We're yeah. seeing that today. Venezuela, Lebanon, we're seeing cr examples of hyperinflation happening today. Can it happen to the US dollar? Yes. I, I'm very sure it can happen. Um, I mean, there is no way back. If you really you're, think you're saying a loaf of bread in the U.S. could cost a thousand dollars, it will. It will come in the next few years. Nobody knows how fast it will happen, but I can see it's accelerating, and it's already a shift in the mindset of the people. We are now talking constantly about it, and it's this kind of fear that of inflation that actually accelerates. Because would I lower my prices anymore? No. I only will rise it in the future. So um, uh, I think there's no way back. And to save the system, I mean, you talked a lot about it. They're going to keep up printing like crazy. It, and it will accelerate. And that's what happens already since 20 years. And now we are more and more in this exponential function. So that's, I think, the most important concept to understand what happens in an exponential function. There is no way around U-turn, nada. You cannot escape this anymore. It's just more and more parabolic. And that's what we're going to have over the next few months and years. Gareth? Yeah, and I think one of the things to realize is that as these prices have gone up, like you were saying, is people are noticing their goods are getting you know, more expensive to buy, more expensive, more expensive, and they're not making more money. And then all of a sudden, what do they start to do? They stop working, right? So now you have this massive shortage in the U.S. that's driving up wages. Well, wages are the number one input cost for businesses. They're going to have to raise costs even more, right? They're going to have to raise those, the, the prices of the widget or whatever even more, which is going to add to inflation. So, I mean, it's already starting here. Um, again, I don't know the time frame. I still think it might be towards the end of this decade uh, with the cycle, but, but it, it's, inflation's not going away. There's no way it's going back to 2%. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm concluding from what, what you said that neither of you agree with Fed Chair Jerome Powell's remarks that inflation is transitory. So no. let's lock in that assumption let's and talk about inflation hedges. Is Bitcoin an inflation hedge? Yes, it is. Um, there's no doubt about it. Well, but first of all, describe in your words what an inflation hedge is. How would you define an inflation hedge? So an inflation hedge should offset the inflation in the do in this case in the dollar. So you know if if if, if inflation is eight percent, then you'd want that asset to increase in value eight percent at least. Florian, what's your definition? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you also have to consider. Like the nominal gain, for example, if you invest in the stock market on average, something like eight to nine percent. Yep. Now you have inflation at eight percent. Then you pay taxes on your gains. It's true. So and then suddenly you don't make any money in real terms. So it's quite tricky. And I think um, we didn't mention that yet. But if we talk about asset allocation, one really important thing is. If you, and I actually can recommend this, look at your net worth every three, four months, put it in an Excel sheet, figure out how much actually am I worth if I would sell everything immediately. And of course, we all would do it primarily in the dollar, in the euro, in the dirham. But do this also in, in gold ounces and do it in Bitcoin. And it will open up your eyes. And everybody who, was, who didn't have at least 10%, 20% in Bitcoin over the last few years, has lost tremendously against Bitcoin. So um, it's very important to look at things from a different perspective as well, not only in dollar terms. And um, I think Bitcoin is probably one of the best inflation hedges. I think also that overall precious metals will be a very good inflation hedge, but we are in a current down, down cycle. The downtrend is still, is still there. So maybe next year when we get a crypto winter, then it's the time for precious metals. Okay. We've got a few minutes left. I'd like to talk about central bank digital currencies and what that will do to the inflation, uh, inflationary environment we're seeing today. Like you both mentioned, you both talked about the M2 money supply. Money supply has hit a new all-time high last year. 
but when you think about it, central bank digital currencies are just a new form of money supply, is it not? It, it is. I, I don't see the difference. Like everyone's talking about, even like the digital yuan, which I mentioned in my um, in my my presentation. There, as long as China controls that, it's no different than if they were just printing the, do, the 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 yuan there. So so as far as I'm concerned, if they came out with a digital dollar, it wouldn't make me get all happy that oh, there's not going to be inflation unless they make specific rules that will garner it not being able to be printed uh, the same way. So they could say one digital dollar is worth a hundred regular dollars. That would be one way to do it. And then they could say okay, and we will only expand at this rate. And then I'd feel better about it. But I don't think they'll do that because they can't. Florian, I've got time for one more question. Okay. I'm going to ask you the same question I've asked you before. Yeah. Will Bitcoin be the best asset in 2022? In 2022? <laughs> oh, I doubt it. I doubt it. I think until the end of the year, yes. I said it already. I made my point over the next few months. Big bull run, probably a big blow off top. And then 2022? Um, no, I don't think so. Thank you both. Great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Kitco News special coverage of the Future Blockchain Summit is brought to you by Cook Finance, a revolution in DeFi asset management.